Good morning, and good morning, and welcome to today's Knowledge Bank. Uh, today's webinar is going to be hosted by Debbie Phillips, Client Service Partner, and Ben Foley, Partner at Brevitons. Um, they're going to be discussing arrears recovery and providing an overview on how they can help you to manage your client's risk and reputation. Um, if you have any questions throughout the webinar, uh, please submit them via the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, and we will try to get through as many as possible at the end. Um, today's webinar is also being recorded and will be available to watch back later today, as will um, a copy of the slides, which will be provided to you via email. Um, that is all from me, and I will now hand you over. Um, thank you very much, Vicky, and good morning, everyone. Thank you for your time this morning. Um, and what we hope will be an informative session on all things arrears recovery. So let me introduce you to our team. Um, ben is a partner and heads up our arrears recovery team, which is, consists of 20 um, people in that team. Um, our colleague Farouk is an associate in the team, and he is on hand today with help with any questions. So please keep them coming, and we will address those at the end of the session. Uh, and as Vicky said, I'm the client service partner, and um, I support our clients and new business opportunities. So if I may, I just wanted to spend um, a couple of minutes on Brevitons. You may already know us um, or in, indeed work with us. So please indulge me for a few minutes if you do. Our award-winning team work closely with our clients in the property sector who tell us it's good to have our experts on hand to manage their disputes. Our process-driven environment means that our service is delivered in a consistent and effective manner. We're really fortunate enough to be working with a large portfolio of managing agents, management companies, freeholders and landlords. We act for many industry leaders who manage thousands of residential and commercial property blocks and units. So in each case, we offer a complete service from that first instruction through to court proceedings if needed. We forge strong relationships with our client who use this time and time again because we do get the job done efficiently and professionally and most importantly with cost certainty. We know you value consistency and reliability so we will agree with you in advance how we work together. Our approach is to adopt a client care ethos and apply this to the processes and procedures that we follow when working on your behalf. Our team considers that our service is summed up as expertise with personal touch via our value-driven, results-based culture. The team is backed up by our support and uh, service teams. Our processes are fully transparent and communication is absolutely key with contact through regular client reviews and who ha we have the accountability and tenacity to deliver great results. So ultimately, you'll care about results and so do we, and that's what today is all about. So on that note, let's focus on arrears recovery. In terms of a disclaimer, I'm not gonna read that out to you. If you just send, uh, spend a couple of seconds, just check in with that, and then I'll hand over to, to Ben just to kick the session off with the more legal stuff. Thanks, Debbie. Morning, everyone. Um, I'm going to begin by talking about the service charge regime found in a typical lease, as well as the relevant statutory provision and codes of practice in place. The service charge regime in most leases will require the preparation of some or all of the following documents. A statement of estimated expenditure, commonly known as a budget. A demand for the payment of service charge on accounts a certified final account and a demand for any balance in charge. Starting with the budget, there is no statutory requirement for this to be in any particular form, but in terms of best practice, guidance can be found in the RICS Service Charge Residential Management Code. The code now in its third edition, I believe, aims to improve general standards and promote best practice, uniformity, reasonableness and transparency in the management and administration of long leasehold residential property to ensure the timely issue of all documentation, including budgets and year-end accounts, and to reduce the cause of disputes and to give guidance to resolving disputes where these do occur. 
The purpose of the budget is to ascertain and support the level of interim service charges demanded on accounts and to provide a robust benchmark for monitoring service costs throughout that period, which is typically a year. For those of you that don't know, an interim service charge demand is a sum paid on account for costs that will be incurred in the future. The code states that a budget should be based on an assessment of expenditure required to maintain the development and services for the forthcoming period and beyond using professional knowledge and experience. The best information should be used to inform the budget estimate. In order of importance, this is likely to be actual costs where contracts are already in place or have previously been agreed, included any anticipated major works or cynical costs to be incurred during the year. Estimates based on actual accounts for the last completed financial year and any known or likely variations for the forthcoming year. And in respect of new development, comparable evidence from similar schemes. A service charge budget should have sufficient detail to enable leaseholders to understand the nature of the charges being levied and the rationale behind the level of estimated expenditure. To allow comparison between years, the code encourages a standard format for presentation to leaseholders. A service charge budget should be as close to the final accounts as possible and must not purposely underestimate costs or provide leaseholders with misleading estimates of future contributions required. But it is appropriate to make allowance for a contingency within the estimated budget and may also, if the lease permits, include contributions to a reserve fund. Emphasis on if the lease permits. Um, and just a quick note before we move on, prior to using contractors for planned and reactive maintenance work, it is good practice to undertake a strict accreditation process to ensure that all contractors can demonstrate their professionalism and compliance. All planned service contracts should be tendered before you enter into any arrangements and comparable quotations should be obtained in relation to large maintenance works. In each instance, you should ensure that good value for money is achieved and of course, consultation requirements should be complied with at all times. Um, I don't intend to spend too much time discussing the accounts other than saying that the code offers some general guidance as follows. Leaseholders should be given an annual statement at the end of each service charge period, giving a summary of the costs and expenditure incurred and a statement of any balance due to either party to the lease. The account should be transparent and reflect all of the expenditure in respect of the account period. And it is also recommended that explanatory notes are included. And it is best practice for prior year numbers and all budgeted figures to be included. All of which is fairly self-explanatory. Um, the same cannot be said for the service charge demand. As far as residential leases are concerned, there has been extensive statutory regulation of service charge demands. Pursuant to section 47 of the Landlord and Tenant Act 1987, any demand for sums due to the landlord of a dwelling must state the name and address of the landlord. And if that address is not in England and Wales, an address in England and Wales of which notices, including notices in proceedings may be served. Section 60, subsection one of the Landlord and Tenant Act 1987 defines a landlord as the immediate landlord. But reference to a landlord under section 47 of the Act does include an RTM company, and this is set out in the Common Hold and Leasehold Reform Act 2002, Schedule 7, Paragraph 12. Sorry, Ben, sorry to interrupt, but your slides are no longer sharing. So I don't know if you just want to double check that quickly. Yeah, of course. better Vicky? No, sorry, they're still not sharing. That's it, that's the best they're back up now. Okay, great. Um, so where sums are due to someone who is not a landlord within the meaning of section 60, so section one, or an RTM company, section 47 does not apply. So a management company, for example, um, that is not the immediate landlord, but who is entitled under the lease to collect a service charge is not required to serve demands that comply with section 47 of the Act. Where the landlord is a company, the requirement to give the landlord's name is not satisfied by giving the name of a director, 
and the requirement to provide the landlord's address is not satisfied by providing the address of the landlord's agent. The purpose of this requirement is to enable a tenant to know who his landlord is, and over the years there has been a lot of case law on this particular point. So where the landlord is an individual, his or her home address or other address where he or she carries on business should be given. And in the case of a corporate landlord, the registered office address or place where he carries on business. If the landlord fails to comply with section 47 of the Act, the tenants are not liable to pay the charges until such time as it does. If a landlord has not complied, all is not lost. All that is required is for notice to be given to the tenant with the name and address of the landlord. And the authority for this can be found in the case of Tedler and Camaria Court Residents Association. Pursuant to section 21B of the Landlord and Tenant Act 1985, a demand for the payment of a service charge must also be accompanied by the appropriate and required summary of rights and obligations. The form and content of that summary, summary can be found in the 2007 regulations and the text of the summary prescribed by the English regulations is set out in Appendix A. With effect from the 1st of July 2013, the summary prescribed by the English regulations was amended to refer to the first tier tribunal rather than the lease or valuation tribunal, as well as setting out the potential cost implications of applications and appeals. And I only make this point 10 years on because old versions are still being used. The summary must be legible in a typewritten or printed form of at least 10 font size and must contain the title service charges, summary of tenant rights and obligations, together with the prescribed information. If the landlord fails to comply with section 21B, a tenant is not liable to pay the service charge until such time as it does. So again, liability to pay is not extinguished entirely, but it is suspended. And a good example of this in practice can be seen in the case of Tudor Roberts in Countryside Residential South West Limited, where the upper tribunal held that a letter before claim, which restated sums previously demanded, and which included all of the information required by section 21B, was a valid demand, albeit that the date for payment had long since passed. And just as a word of caution, section 20B of the Landlord and Tenant Act 1985 provides that costs are not recoverable if they were incurred more than 18 months before being demanded. And this underpins the importance of a robust credit control function. And I'll pass you back over to, to Debbie. Thank you. Um, I think our slides have actually frozen as well. I'm sorry, we're having a few technical issues, aren't we, this morning? Um, but if I continue whilst we, we try and get back on track um, with regard to the slides. So in terms of the um, referral process, what do we need from you? Well, in short, very little. Um, we need name and address of the client, name and address of the leaseholder, a statement of account, and we will effectively do the rest. So um, we need to make sure you know, we have a no surprises culture and we aim to um, actually recover all our charges through this process. And we will come on to what do we actually do that's slightly different to some of our, uh, some of our competitors in terms of compliance, et cetera, and what we do up front. But in short, very little is required from you. We will do the rest. So in terms of the legal and compliance review that I was just referring to, um, we have put in a very robust process that actually we follow the pre-action protocol um, and Ben will come on to what, uh, what process we actually follow for that. But before we start that process and before we send out that first letter of claim, we actually have a team of people doing all due diligence on the, on the compliance and legal review before we, we start. So we will do a conflict search. We will check that we have authority to act through several means. We will do a lease review to make sure that we understand, you know, um, what cost clauses are, et cetera, are included in that. And we will do a risk assessment. So if through that process, um, we spot that 
hasn't been demanded, you guys haven't demanded correctly, or not to the right, right party, or if there's any queries whatsoever, then we will revert to you and get that sorted so that we can start the process in earnest. So to start the action itself, we're required to send a letter of claim and ensure compliance with the relevant protocol. Um, the relevant protocol is the pre-action protocol for debt claims. Um, it was introduced in October 2017 and applies to any business claiming payment of the debt from an individual, including an individual in business as a sole trader. The requirements imposed by the protocol were introduced with the main aim of encouraging communication between the parties and the early disclosure of information in an attempt to resolve disputes without the need to go to court. I don't necessarily believe this has been achieved and the civil justice statistics published by the Ministry of Justice would, would certainly suggest otherwise. Um, that said, compliance with the protocol does provide us with a framework for dealing with vulnerable debtors uh, and debtors who are in genuine financial difficulty, which is always important, but particularly so during the pandemic um, and, and, and the current cost of living um, crisis. The protocol requires a letter of claim to be sent by the creditor to the debtor, detailing the basis of the claim, including details of any written or oral contract and any charges and interest which have been added to the debt. When the protocol was introduced, there was a lot of confusion and debate about whether a copy of the contract, so the lease itself, had to be provided with a letter of claim. Uh, and to be clear, it does not. Um, it simply needs to be made available on request. What should be provided is, is a statement of accounts, uh, an information sheet, uh, a reply form, and a financial statement. Uh, with the exception of the statement of accounts, each of these documents is an annex to the protocol. Um, the information sheet offers some general guidance to the debtor and explains where debt advice can be sought, um, so the likes of the, the CAB and, and step change. The reply form is the form which the debtor should use to respond to the letter of claim, so the debtor can admit the debt in full or in part, um, or dispute the debt in its entirety. And the financial statement is a form where the debtor can share details of his or her income and expenditure and put forward an offer of repayment. The letter of claim itself should be sent by first class post and by email if specifically requested. If the debtor does not reply to the letter of claim within 30 days uh, of the date of the letter, um, the creditor may start court proceedings subject to any remaining obligations the creditor may have to the debtor. This initial 30 day period can be extended if a debtor indicates that debt advice is being sought, the creditor must allow the debtor a reasonable period for the advice to be obtained. This is subjective, but common sense should prevail. And, and at this point, whilst on the subject of debt advice, I'm just going to mention the, the debt respite scheme or the breathing space scheme. Um, it was introduced at a, a similar time to the COVID-19 pandemic, but not, not in response to it. Um, it had been under consultation for some time prior to its implementation. Um, it is, however, important because it will give someone in problem debt the right to certain legal protection um, from their creditors. And there are two types of breathing space, a standard breathing space and a mental health crisis breathing space. A standard breathing space is available to anyone with a problem debt. It gives them legal protection from creditor action for up to 60 days. The protections include pausing enforcement action and contact from creditors and freezing most interest and charges on their debts. A mental health crisis breathing space is only available to someone who is receiving mental health treatment. It lasts as long as the person's treatment lasts, plus an additional 30 days, no matter how long the treatment lasts. As a creditor, if you're told that a debt owed to you is in breathing space, you must stop all action related to that debt and apply the protections. These protections must stay in place until the breathing space ends. A breathing space can be started by a debt advice provider who is authorised by the Financial Conduct Authority to offer debt counselling. 
or a local authority where they provide debt advice to residents. Debt advice providers are responsible for the administration of a breathing space. They are the point of contact for the debtor, their creditors and the insolvency service. And as you'd expect with the cost of living crisis, breathing space is becoming more common. Going back to the protocol, if a debtor requests a document or additional information from the creditor, this must be provided within 30 days of receipt of the request. And if it is not available, the creditor must explain why in writing. And there is an incentive here to provide the information as soon as possible because the debt action is effectively stayed until such time it is provided. And from my experience, failure to comply in a timely fashion will simply result in a data subject access request, which is far more onerous to deal with, with quite serious sanctions for non-compliance. If a debtor indicates that they require time to pay, the protocol states that the party should try to agree repayment terms. Of course, this is not always realistic or possible. So where a creditor does not accept a proposal put forward by a debtor, this should be communicated to the debtor in writing. Alternative dispute resolution is actively encouraged by the court. And so where the parties cannot agree about the existence, enforceability, amount, or any other aspect of the debt, the protocol states that they should, they should take appropriate steps to resolve the dispute without the need to start court proceedings. Helpfully, the protocol is clear that alternative dispute resolution may simply take the form of discussion and negotiation. But in some cases, especially where the debt is large, mediation, so that, that, that involves a sort of a third party facilitating a resolution may be appropriate. The overriding objective of the civil procedure rules is to deal with cases at a proportionate cost. So it follows that the potential cost of mediation should be considered in relation to the amount of the debt. So for a small claim, it's likely to be deemed disproportionate. And in terms of non-compliance and sanctions, the court will consider whether all parties have complied in substance with the protocol, um, but they are unlikely to be concerned with minor or technical infringements, especially where the matter is urgent. Non-compliance is unlikely to be fatal to the debt action, but may result in adverse consequences um, or it may limit the amount of interest you're able to recover. There will inevitably be claims that need to be issued. Um, and where this is the case, a claim proceeds under either CPR 7 or CPR 8. So CPR is the civil procedure rules. CPR 7 is the default method for issuing claims and is the route adopted by Bretherton's. We know this because part eight has clearly defined circumstances in which it can be used as set out in rule 8.12 which states that a claimant may use the Part A procedure where he seeks the court's decision on a question which is unlikely to involve a substantial dispute of fact. It is clearly possible to imagine a debt claim which does not involve a substantial dispute of fact. That said, it's unlikely that many claims would fall within this heading. Service charge disputes in the main are likely to involve disputes of fact for example, whether a service was provided at all or to a reasonable standard. And even ground rent disputes often turn on factual questions, for example, whether a demand was sent or received. It follows that while some claims could be issued under Part 8, to adopt a blanket approach is, in our, our opinion, high risk. And there are a number of important differences between Part 7 and Part 8. For a Part 8 claim, both the claim form and the reply must be accompanied by any written evidence which the parties intend to rely on. This means that witness statements, demands, invoices, etc., all need to be served together with the claim form, which is potentially very onerous, time-consuming and expensive. Each case has to be, in effect, prepared for trial, even though a large proportion of said cases will not be defended. Default judgment is not available under Part 8, which means there will always have to be at least one hearing and provision, therefore, for someone to attend with the cost occasioned by the same. 
an apartheid claim is automatically allocated to the mortgage track. So the court had the full range of cost powers available to them at the end of the case. And whilst it had accepted that this may be useful where the lease does not allow the landlord to recover legal costs, it does also leave open the possibility of a cost order being made against the landlord. So unlike a Part 8 claim, if the defendant responds, fails to respond to a Part 7 claim, the claimant can request judgment in default. The defendant has 14 days to initially respond to the claim, but this can be increased to 56 days with the consent of all the parties. Where judgment in default is requested, so where there is no response to the claim, this is an administrative task and does not require a hearing. Where the claim itself is defended, the court will impose case management directions to progress the claim to a, fi a final hearing. And I'm going to pass you over to Fruit now, who will talk for 10 minutes or so just about the defended process. Some of the words that we've touched on um, during today's webinar have been cost certainty, due diligence, risk assessment. Um, we, we take those steps at the start of the process and we continue those steps throughout. Um, where a claim is being defended, we'll do a, far, a further thorough um, risk assessment, discuss the options that are available to ourselves and work out exactly where we are, we'd like to take this matter. For us, it's, it's ultimately providing a service which is beneficial to yourselves. Um, so if, if the client, the ultimate client has no appetite of proceeding to trial, um, we'll try and reach a resolution which is amicable for the parties and, and in line with your instruction. One of the services um, that are available, um, Ben touched on um, mediation um, and possibly um, ADR not being um, cost effective if the matter is a small claim. The small claims track does offer a small claims mediation service. Um, the service is set up by the court itself. Um, a mediator will often call both parties, um, try and understand the circumstances, and if possible, try and reach an amicable resolution on that day. Um, the, meet, the appointment lasts for about an hour and both parties will be shared details of the, the arrangement, the agreement, which is then drafted by the mediator. There are various enforcement options. Um, so if we're able to obtain a default judgment or a judgment at the end of, at the end of trial, um, there are various enforcement options that... Spare me a moment. The various enforcement options that are available to, to ourselves. Um, the co most cost-effective option is referring the matter to High Court Enforcement. There is usually a, a transfer up fee, which is included within that within within that cost. High Court Enforcement will arrange for an for an agent to attend the premises. And if you have any further contact details, any additional telephone numbers which might have been obtained during the process, that's always useful to provide High Court Enforcement to make an attendance at the property. They'll look at seizing assets um, to the value of the debt. And then the other options available to us are um, if, for example, we're aware that the, 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 the leaseholder may not be residing in the country, um, there's been no contact whatsoever throughout the proceedings, and you, you might be dealing with the debtor who has a history um, of, of failing to pay their service charge or ground rent debt, there is the option to obtain a charging order with the possible option of proceeding with an order for sale. So initially we'd make an application to the court to obtain a charging order. It allows us to put a restriction on the property so the property can't be sold without us being notified of the same. Um, usually if there are other charge holders, um, they would also be notified of the application as well and then our charge would be placed accordingly with land registry. Um, we've then got the option sometimes when you've got a debtor that's been the same situation for a number of years, a repeat offender, where various judgments have now been mounting up. You can look at combining those judgments and possibly seeking an order for sale, um, which we can touch on in the further webinars. Um, the option is also available for a third party debt order. So if you've got the bank account details for one of your leaseholders, um, we can make an application to see if there's any funds available in the account. Um, the, with, once an application has been listed for a hearing, the leaseholders will be notified of the same. 
and um, the bank will freeze those assets so they can't withdraw those sums until the hearing's been listed and heard. Um, the, the best option sometimes is if we're acting on behalf of a landlord, we could look at process proceeding with a, a section 146 notice. Um, a section 146 notice is usually recognised as a notice before forfeiture. Um, most of the time when there is a, a lender involved, um, the notice um, would, would be sufficient and sometimes enough for the lender to kind of step in and look to protect their own security. So it's usually on the receipt of a section 146 notice informing them that our instruction now is to proceed with forfeiture of the lease by issuing a possession claim. Um, they will usually seek to protect their position and may result in payment of the outstanding judgment debt, plus any costs associated with section 146 notice. It usually requires about 28 days. Um, in that period, they'll usually write out to their borrower, informing them that we've been notified by the solicitors that they are intending and proceeding with forfeiture of the lease and just give them a final opportunity to kind of come back and say whether they're intending on paying the debt themselves or whether the lender is going to make that payment on their behalf. Brooke, just going back to the defended process and you mentioned the small claims mediation service. In your, in your experience, the most claims settle at mediation? Yes, I think it's a good opportunity to kind of, um, not much of a gambler, but look at your hand and kind of look at what you're dealing with, kind of look at the arguments that have been placed. And sometimes if there are merits, say we find that some of the issues that the, the leaseholder is raising are quite genuine and there is a chance that if the matter proceeds to trial, that um, it could go against our client. It's a good opportunity to kind of look at that risk of proceeding to trial and say, OK, it might be beneficial to all parties involved here to, to try and look at reaching a settlement. The, the, most people don't know about this, but the mediators are quite willing to... Um, not bend the rules, but exercise their discretion to allow a further 24 hours after the mediation appointment to allow parties to try a final attempt at resolving the matter without it proceeding to trial. Which is, just to be clear, so a, a small claim, that's any claim with a value up to £10,000. Um, the fast track is the appropriate claim for any claim with a value of between 10 and 25 and then and then the multi-track is is the appropriate um, uh, track for any claim, £25,000 and, and, and above. Um, like I said before, the, the purpose of a, um, a small claim is to, is to deal with cases justly and at a, at a proportionate cost. So the case management directions that you'd see for a small claim defended case, they're far less onerous as, as you sort of expect to see in some of the more complex litigation. So the standard requirement on the on the small claims track is for the parties simply to provide any sort of written evidence that they intend to rely upon 14 days before um, the, the hearing itself. Um, we, we don't see sort of um, onerous disclosure requirements or or the need to um, sort of instruct and obtain expert evidence in, in the majority of, of, of small claims at, at least. Um, uh, through moved on to to enforcement often you know getting the the determination the county court judgment is is the easy part um enforcing the judgment is, uh, itself is, is is far more difficult um as as for mentioned in the ideal world there will be a mortgage company that we can we can approach for payment with or without a um a section 146 notice if forfeiture is a, a remedy available so that to the client, um, but yeah, I mean, hopefully you can see that there are lots of other enforcement options um, available um, in those cases where there isn't a mortgage company or where section um, 146 and forfeiture isn't available. Um, I'm just going to go into them in a little bit more detail, starting with the with the third party debt order. Um, so if you have reason to believe that a debtor has an account with a with a bank or a building society, we can apply for a third party debt order. Um, in an ideal world, a sort code and an account number will be available, um, but it's not crucial. Um, a bank or building society served with an interim third party debt order must carry out a search to identify all accounts held by the debtor. Um, if an account with a credit balance is located, and those funds are then ring-fenced until such time as the courts decide whether to make the order final. If the order is made final, then the bank or building society is then under an obligation 
to release the funds to settle the judgment debts in full um, or in part. Um, and a third party debt order can be extended to rental income. So if you have reason to believe that the debtor is receiving a rental income, it may be that we can obtain an order that such income is paid to the client to satisfy the judgment debt again in full or in part. Um, if the lessee is employed, we can, we can make an application for an attachment of earnings order. Um, this is not a particularly popular method of enforcement because there is a protected earnings rate and affordability criteria um, and often only nominal payments are awarded uh, and as such it can take quite a long time for the debt to be paid. Um, as Farouk mentioned, we can apply for a charge and order and then make a subsequent application for an order for sale. Um, an order for sale would force the sale of the charged property, either uh, immediately or sometime in the future if a suspended order is made, and the proceeds of sale would be used to pay the judgment debt after other secured loans ranking in priority have been paid. Uh, in compliance with the, the civil procedure rules and as part of our due diligence process, uh, we will obtain a valuation uh, and a redemption statement from all secured creditors prior to making an application for an order for sale. Um, the client can then be satisfied that there is sufficient equity in the property to justify such an application. Um, the application itself is subject to case-by-case -case judicial discretion uh, and case law. Um, in each case, the judge will consider a, a number of factors, um, including whether it's proportionate to grant the order for sale. Um, that said, there are no rules or presumptions. Whether the property in question is the primary residence of the debtor, who else may reside within the property, including children, and whether the debtor should be granted more time to pay, resulting in a suspended order. Both the Charge and Order Act 1979 and the County Court Act 1984 give the court wide discretion to refuse an order for sale or suspend it on terms that the debtor pays the, uh, the debt by instalments. Um, guidance on the civil procedure rules provided by the Supreme Court advises judges that an order for sale is an extreme sanction and all circumstances must be considered. Um, however, the same guidance also states that the sale of the debtor's home is likely to be ordered if there has been a neglect or refusal to pay or in a case where in reality without a sale the judgment debt will not be paid. Um, so even if the order for sale is suspended on terms that the debtor repays the debt by instalments, uh, in our experience this does focus the mind of the debtor and reduces the likelihood of any default in the future. So, as I shared earlier, ultimately you will care about results and so do we. So, I just wanted to share a snapshot on what we class as the, the happy path, if you like, the straightforward end-to-end -end process um, with incremental costs through to default judgment. The guys have just gone into quite a bit of detail on what happens for those exceptions, what happens if we actually go down the defended route. I just wanted to share one slide out of many that we have from our full management information suite, which measures every instruction we receive and measures what we're actually doing with it, how long that matter's taking and what our ultimate results are. So you'll see from the bar chart on the right of your screen that actually we've broken our data, and this is live data for the last 12 months for all um, clients that we are progressing matters within our arrears recovery team for the last 12 months. And on to the left of that, adjacent to that, is what's been happening in the last month. So we all know it's very cyclical, isn't it, in terms of you know when are the demands due, um, when does it trigger from you guys before it comes into a solicitor. So it, it does, you know, it, it does obviously fluctuate, but I'm really pleased to share that 82% actually um, in the last 12 months of all instructions have actually been recovered and closed out without issuing. So we've got the extreme cases in terms of the, um, the where we have defended, but we've also got the default judgment route. So you'll see the top, uh, the top two bars actually are where um, we have closed out on either um, judgment or issue. So um, really important to, to share that 
and that we have a full suite of uh, management information to, to help manage those instructions as they come through. Debbie, do you think um, COVID-19 and the current cost of living crisis has affected those stats in any way? In short, yes. Um, I, you'll all be aware that we had a standstill period, didn't we, through COVID where we weren't able to issue proceedings, we weren't able to, um, you know, enforce through through other means. So, um, and, you know, a lot of a lot of managing agents out there, rightly so, um, you know, put matters on hold and, and really tried to avoid um, bringing anybody through a, through a defended route. So, yes, the, the figures have changed. Um, but I think we are now getting back to um, sort of the, the sort of outcomes that we had pre pre pandemic. Um, who knows what the cost of living uh, crisis will do? But safe to say that that we're here with a really robust process, compliance at the heart of everything we do to make sure we're recovering as quickly as possible to get those service charge ground rent arrears back in the right account so that you can manage your blocks. So we have a great team and they're, they're there ready to support. So um, always a bit cheesy, but I always say to our clients, don't take our word for it. You know, we can, we can tell you how brilliant we are till the cows come home and we can talk about um, all things property, you know, ad, ad infinitum. But, you know, our clients say really good things about us and um, just wanted to share, not going to read it out, you'll be pleased to hear, um, but th there's a few things here that our clients have to say about us that, that we're proud uh, and we're proud to do the work that we do uh, to, to support the, uh, the property industry out there. So thank you on behalf of the Bretherton's team. I think we're going to turn now, hopefully you've been bombarding us with questions. Um, so that um, we can have the opportunity now. I think we've got enough time to, to really be able to, to cover off some questions for you. Right, so Farouk, first question. Creation protocol for debt claims. Is there any suggestion that that's going to be changed going forward? I understand it was under sort of consultation that ended at the beginning of last year. Um, I think we're still awaiting a, a response to that consultation, aren't we? But uh, um, No, we're, we're, we're keeping tabs on it. So at the start, even when the production protocol was introduced, um, we have very good links with the County Port Users Association. So we attend regular meetings where these sort of things are discussed. Um, initially, um, Ben touched on when we going through the webinar today about um, it not being a requirement to include at least within the letter of claim. Um, this was something which we got approval and we, we discussed at length at the County Court Use Association um, meetings. So um, in, in short, um, it is under review. Um, we are on top of it and we are attending regular meetings and rest assured that if we um, are aware of any changes that will be coming into play, we will definitely be coming in contact with our clients, making sure that their process, as well as our process, is, is um, amended to reflect any changes which are incoming. I think um, the pandemic's another good period for us to kind of reflect on how we were very quickly able to adjust our process um, to, to assist with recovering the debt for our clients, as well as assisting people that are in genuine financial difficulty. Mm. We have a small RMC with a high proportion of elderly leaseholders and sadly several will pass away each year. What advice does the panel have for, for managing arrears um, on the service charge account, um, both before uh, and after a grant of probate or administration? Um, from experience, I think in those sort of circumstances, it, it's important to... Um, be in contact with those leaseholders and their representatives. I think it's important that it's the court, similar to, we share very similar values with the court. Like they want to see litigation as being the last court, last course of action. So whilst you're having that engagement with your leaseholders or their families or representative, it's important to recognize whether any sort of um, information is being 
provided where where the payment is going to be forthcoming if it's something which is completely out of the picture and then when if, if you're left with no option but to pursue those arrears you can demonstrate to the court that you really have tried everything you possibly could to pursue those sums um, without obviously proceeding with litigation um, so I think I think the best sort of advice I can give in those sort of circumstances is probably just to, to engage, find out, exhaust all your options in trying to to, to understand where you where, what the what the ch um, chances of, of that payment being made for those arrears, and just exhausting your internal options and then referring it over to us. And we 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 are um, a friendly bunch. Uh, we do try our best to try and. Um, empathise with with debtors, understand their circumstances, and then obviously liaise with yourselves and communicate any sort of difficulties to try and avoid litigation where we can. But sometimes, in some circumstances, it's it's an option that um, it's it's a path, unfortunately, that can't be avoided. And, and we are ready to, and, and we are we are we are make sure, we make sure that we we are fully equipped that if we do go down that route, we can justify our reasons for doing so to escape any sort of criticism. One leaseholder owes us over £10,000 over the past several years. Um, despite winning, winning a court case, he has refused to pay. He doesn't appear to have that much in terms of assets. How can we recover this much needed and sizable amount of money? This is one of those where we, you, um, this is one where you'd need to send it over to us so we can run through our conflict checks. We'd be more than happy to review the situation, come back and help you. Um, I've already got a number of solutions in mind, but um, given that it's a, an ongoing matter, I think we, it'd be necessary and, and compliant for us to do those checks before I can um, assist with any sort of advice. But by all means, feel free to send it over to us. I'm sure yeah. the webinar um, slides are going to be communicated to everybody. And um, when you, you have our email addresses, feel free to send that over to us. We're more than happy to help with that and any other circumstances which, which may be of help. Just as, just, just as some, some general guidance, so it is possible to um, make an application. It's called an application for an order of questioning. Um, so it requires the, the, the judgment debtor to attend court to answer questions under oath about his or her financial position and um, you know what assets they they do and, or don't have. So so that may be something that, that can be explored, um, sort of to, to give you an idea of what the most appropriate enforcement method would be. Debbie touched on success stories, but I'll give you a bit of a story from experience with one of those sort of applications. We had a similar sort of data that um, we made a similar sort of application for, and, and they tried moving the money in the last minute, um, but we were able to demonstrate that to, to the court that they just moved X amount from one account to another. So that's, that sort of application has been useful, and we have got success stories for going down that path. Debbie, are your fees fixed fees or based on a percentage of the debts? Um, and is there any upfront cost to pay um, to commence a legal action? Um, well, we are a no surprises culture, as you would expect of us, and we aim to recover all our charges, um, including disbursements, etc., from the def defaulting leaseholder. Um, so we are fixed fee, it's incremental costs. Um, through the process. So where I showed you earlier that actually we're really proud of the success rate and of what stage we close out at. Um, each stage has additional costs because it's extra, um, extra work that is required for it. So our aim is to recover as much as we possibly can um, at letter of claim stage. So letter of claim stage within that um, sort of 30 day period, sending out a letter of claim, us following up on that letter of claim. So we, uh, we hit the phones, we've got a specialist team um, of call handlers making sure that we're there to first call um, resolution, objection handling, all those things may not be familiar with, but ultimately that means let's recover the money and get it into your bank account. 57% um, were closed out at that stage. So long answer to a short question, are you fixed fee? Yes, we are. Um, we're fixed fee to the defaulting leaseholder, but incremental costs as we go through the process. Okay. One final question for you, unless any more pop up. Um, can you expand on the court's mediation procedure? When does it kick in and is it compulsory? Yeah, of course. Um, so once the claim is being defended, 
um, the call issue case management direction. So the, the order that we normally receive from the court will say, this matter is now defended, here's a copy of the defense, parties are required by so-and-so date to file directions questionnaires. Um, within the directions questionnaire, um, there is an option if the matter has been allocated to a small claims track for parties to agree to mediate. Now, if both parties have ticked that box, uh, agreeing to mediate, the court will arrange for the mediation, mediation session to be arranged. So the court, will, the process would be usually the court will send out an email. This is the proposed mediation date, are parties available? Um, if so, please um, confirm, confirm that you're happy to um, agree a compromise to try and reach a settlement. Um, it's always the court look at mediation as um, a positive um, option for all the parties and want parties to engage in it. So we would always advise that you know you, you agree to mediate. Um, what usually happens then is that the mediator will usually call the claimants, solicitors, um, ask exactly why the claim has been issued, we'll set out um, the reasons for issuing the claim, what sums are included within the process, because they don't have a copy of the papers to hand. They rely on the information that's provided during that mediation appointment. Um, following the, the conversation with the claimant's representative, they'd go and speak to the defendant. So they go and speak to the leaseholder, try and understand what their defense is, why they haven't made payment, um, and, and keep going back and forth within the hour appointment to try and see if there's any sort of agreement that can be reached. Um, like I said before, um, if an agreement, say for example, um, the, the defendant turns around and says, well, I'm wanting, I'm wanting to make payment, but today I've never seen a copy of the accounts. Um, we're able to go back to the client during that meeting, request that information, say for example, if the client's not available, we can then request that the window's open for 24 hours for us to obtain that information. They do keep a record of the stats of how many matters close out during the small claims mediation appointment. So it's in their interest also to try and do everything they possibly can um, in, in terms of the actual um, call service themselves to try and um, set up a, a forum where the parties can try and reach a resolution if one's possible. Um, the best thing about it as well um, is we always like to try and save our clients money where, wherever we can. Normally, if you were trying to uh, reach an agreement outside of mediation, you'd be required to file um, a, a consent order or a Tomlin order, an agreement basically with the court, which usually costs about £100 to file with the court. Best thing about mediation as well is if you can reach an agreement during that mediation appointment, um, you can save on that expense as well. The mediation agreement, um, the court will draft for us at no expense. One more for Ike. Um, can you apply for forfeiture of the lease based on service charge arrears, or does this relate to uh, rent only? The service charge arrears would need to exceed £350. Um, they would need to be, if they don't exceed £350, I believe that it needs to be outstanding for a period of time before it can be pursued. Um, if your client is intending to, um, and I don't want to delve too much into this, but if they do intend on going down the forfeiture route, there's various things when you do instruct us that you need to ensure that you do to ensure you don't waive the right to forfeit during the process. So, for example, um, if your client's instructions are that they want to proceed with forfeiture and you're referring the matter over to us, but then when the leaseholder um, contacts you, you're providing copies of demands or you're uh, accepting part payments, those are all things which can waive your right to forfeit. So it's important that if your instruction is to proceed with forfeiture from the start of the arrears process, that it's important to ensure that these these um, these mechanisms are put in place to ensure the right to forfeit hasn't been waived. And it, it's always, we're, we're very transparent, as Debbie touched on at the start of this webinar. Um, it's very important to just, just explain that to us at the start, that you know you do intend on forfeiting for whatever reason, to make sure that we can assist you as well from the very get-go, rather than kind of waiting for it to be defended and finding out that there's various steps that possibly could have been taken at the start of the process, which may have um, now waived your right to forfeit and all cause you any sort of issues proceeding down that route. Anyway, so, so in response, yes, there are um, certain um, times that you can forfeit based on service charge arrears. It doesn't have to be um, ground rent, but as is always the case, proceed with a high degree of caution. It has to be a remedy that's available to the to the client. And as this group mentioned, you've got to be very, very careful not to waive the right to, to, to forfeit. Um, I think that brings us to the end of the, the question.
question. So Vicky, we'll, we'll pass back over to you. Oh, lovely. Sorry, my video wasn't kicking in then. <laughs> thanks, guys, for all of your time. Um, thanks to everyone who's joined us today. Um, Brevertons are going to be back on the 8th of August, um, where Roger Hardwick and Emma Bush are going to be presenting another webinar. Um, the topic of that webinar is recovering the cost of fire safety work as a service charge. Um, so if you would like to register for that, please uh, visit the news on the block website. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the webinar has been recorded, so I'll be able to send that out later today with a copy of the slides. Um, otherwise, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you guys for your time, and I will see you soon. Thanks, Thank you. Bye.